Ever wondered what makes a French woman French? A certain je ne sais quoi? And a lot more. Follow in the footsteps of storyteller Edith de Belleville, a native Parisian who brings to life the hidden histories of the great women who shaped and influenced the France we know today. In each part of this radio series, Edith will take you to a different arrondissement of Paris with plenty of anecdotes and secrets to share. Ooh la la, mais oui. Episode number 10, Georges Sand. Tell me which word in particular you associate with Georges Sand. The word uh, I have in mind when I think about her, it's freedom. Freedom to choose another identity, another name, because her real name was uh, Aurore Dupin and not Georges Sand. Freedom uh, sexually because she had many lovers and young lovers. And she even had uh, a woman as a lover, uh, Marie Dorval. Freedom uh, politic, because she was very involved in the, um, the revolution of 1848, the barricades. She even created a newspaper. Freedom legally, because she's the first woman who could uh, be separate from her husband, because there was no divorce and uh, freedom as a, to be independent with money, uh, economically independent, because she's a woman who could live, and she lived very well, thanks to her books, which was not very easy for a woman at these times. And freedom of a friendship, she chose a friend. It's really, an, another freedom is freedom to travel. It's really the woman who was um, emancipated thanks to the literature very interesting uh, model. She's very, very modern woman. Tell us about her childhood, how she grew up, what were the forces that shaped her life later on? Uh, sh- childhood explains many things about her life. Uh, she was born 1st of July 1804, the same uh, year than the civil code from Napoleon. And she was born only one month after her parents married because she comes from um, very two different backgrounds. Her father uh, comes from a family, royal um, aristocratic family, King of Poland, Maréchal de Saxe, who was a, was a great military soldier, of Louis XV, a very well-known family. And the mother's side, it's less um, glamorous. The father was selling birds on the, near the Seine River. The grandmother was prostitute. So it's very the commoner, uh, which explains why she was so involved with the, the working class during the, in 1848. So she was in Spain with her um, her father and her mother because her father was a soldier of uh, Murat, the Napoleon soldier. And at this time in Spain, it was awful. You know, it was civil war, the Napoleon's war. It was devastated. She came back to France with her father and her mother and she had a little brother who was born and she saw really dead people in the villages awful she was sick she arrived at last in Noan Noan will be always um, the center of her life it's in Berry, center of France so she arrived um, to the grandmother the mother the father side uh, Madame Dupin and she's five years old and when they arrive they're relieved and just a, a link to Victor Hugo, because Victor Hugo saw exactly the same Spain devastated than the, um, v- uh, Georges Sand, because the father of uh, Victor Hugo was also a soldier of Napoleon. Mm-hmm. So there are many common points between Victor Hugo and Georges Sand. So she arrived and the little brother uh, died because he was sick. So the mother was uh, devastated, awful. And one week later, 
her beloved father died, which is really silly because he survived the war, he survived everything in the civil war in Spain, and he died because he was riding horses. He fell and uh, he died. So the mother is uh, really um, very sad. The grandmother who really, really loved Maurice's uh, son was devastated. So what happened? The grandmother said to the she really did hate a daughter-in-law because she was not a prostitute, but almost, you know, she was not from the same, um, not aristocrat. So she said she, she bought, she bought uh, um, Amantine uh, Aurore Dupin, which is the real name of uh, Georges Sand. She said, okay, I give you money and you go back to Paris. And the mother said, okay. So you can imagine a little girl, she's abandoned by the mother, she's an orphan, and she's raised by the grandmother, so it's a big shock. The grandmother was nice, but she was strict, and, and uh, Aurore was very lonely, you know, and uh, so she, what did she do? She read books, many, many books. And it, she had a private teacher who was very original. He taught her uh, physical physics and uh, mathematics. And it's him who suggested her, when she was a teenager, to, ri to ride horses with a man's clothes. Mm. So since she's a, she was a little girl, she was used to wear men's clothes to ride horses mm. and ride horses like a man. So the idea to, because we have the image of uh, Georges Sand with men's clothes, comes from her childhood. She spent several years in a convent, an English convent, and learned to speak fluent English there. Absolutely. From 14 to 18, she was in a convent in Paris, which was uh, good for her because she had uh, something peaceful. She had peace. When she was 18 years old, her grandmother died. So she's uh, here. She has money. She has a no on the big house. But she's uh, legally, she's a minor. And uh, the mother is very, was very neurotic. She was really after her. She was very bossy. She was harassing her. So she decided, how can I do how to go away from this? Mm -hmm. What the only solution at this time, because when, uh, she got married, she found a nice man, uh, friendly, and she married him, le baron de Dudevant. And she tried, she had the uh, children, and she did the best to be the perfect housewife. But uh, no, she, she knew how to sew, how to cook, she was singing, she liked the music, but... Uh, the, poor, the husband, he was falling asleep when she was playing piano. He was falling asleep when she was reading literature because she liked literature. She, he, what the, the husband liked was having affair with the maids. So she understood uh, she's very um, depressed. She really had a nervous breakdown, you know. When she had nervous breakdown when she had the kids too, and the, the, the partum, the, the, the baby blues that we call now. And what she did, she had lovers. And uh, in 1830, she found a letter of the husband. The stupid husband wrote a letter, open only when I'm dead. So what did she do? She opened the letter and she read and she saw, she read that he said horrible things about her. Fortunately, uh, the mother who was not stupid uh, said we will do a contract because the husband had all the rights and uh, had the, in the contract it was written he couldn't sell the, what did belong to the wife and he had to give her money each month. So she said, she was very angry, she said, listen, I read the letter, now it's over. I go to Paris, you will have to give me money, I will come each three months to see the kids, I leave. Mm. Another way to be free. So she mm. decided to Paris in 1830. And she's the first woman, I have to say. She had not the divorce, it didn't exist, but the, um, how do you say, separation. Mm -hmm. It's a lawyer, Michel de Bourges, who had an affair with her because it was a big revolution. So she opened the way for what becomes later a divorce. Absolutely. So really always a pioneer and a feminist, a strong mm -hmm. feminist. And a fighter. Yeah, because she was writing for women, a fight, absolutely. Mm -hmm. George Sand found herself right at the heart of a very important movement in France, the Romantic period. Tell us about her role in that and the people she knew and the art movement of the time. 
Yes, the Romantic Movement, it did last uh, 20 years, but it was very important. The idea is to break the codes. It's the young people, the rebels against the old people. And to break the code in literature, the chief is Victor Hugo, but not the Victor Hugo with a bla the white beard, you know, oh, the no, the young, <laughs> yeah, the young one, a rebel, who wrote the famous uh, theatre play Hernani, was a big revolution. And in painting, it's Delacroix using the big colors. And Delacroix was a very close friend to Georges Sand. He was going in Nohant for holidays. He was painting. And it's Georges Sand who taught him who to... He discovered the flowers, nature. And that's why he painted flowers, thanks to Georges Sand. They had, a, how do you say, a friendship... Um, a romantic. romantic friendship. With, uh, George, Delacroix was very good looking. Eh? And so, and the, the beauty canon too, the romantic woman, because Georges Sand, she was really like the beauty, uh, the romantic woman. She had black eyes and white skin. It's very romantic. And dark hair. Dark hair, very romantic. You have to be pale. She was pale. And you have to look, Baudelaire said, les beautés de l'hôpital. Yeah, you, you, because if you want to be fashionable, romantic woman. You have to look woman, poorly, look sickly. Sickly. You have to look sick. Sickly is so what do you do when you're a fashionable woman? You don't sleep to have the... Um, and you don't go out in the sunlight? Never. And you get bags under your eyes? This is it. And they were putting the, the ladies uh, green under the eyes to look sick. And they were also putting um, something in the eyes mm -hmm. to look if you were crying, just to be romantic. The The... the the romantic woman, we have the idea, is uh, la dame aux camélias. It's Camille in, in English, you know, Alexandre Dumas song, the woman who, <coughs> yeah. who caffeine, who always sick. This is a romantic lady, fragile, poor little thing, you know. So this is the romantic movement, you see. And she arrived in 1830, the problem. She knows nobody, she misses nobody, she doesn't have a husband, she doesn't know anyone, she doesn't have a, a famous lover. So, what does she do? She met Jules Sando, 19 years old, she's 26 years old, you know, always young uh, lovers. And uh, they were living in a cave in the Seine River. And if you like Georges Sands, there is very interesting uh, walk to do in Paris because you have many places where she used to live. And uh, she writes for newspapers and they, they write her first novel, Rose, Rose et Blanche, together. And the man wanted to be famous. She, she never wanted to be famous. She never wanted to write, which is funny. You know, she, she didn't say, I want to be a writer. Not at all. She wanted to get money. She liked to write, it's true, but she didn't have the idea to be famous. Mm -hmm. And what is funny, it's the book was quite well known. Of course, the young lover became extremely jealous and she broke with her, he became violent. That's another problem she had with the lovers. They always wanted to dominate her. So they, she became a bit famous and she writes another novel, um, Indiana, with a pseudonym, is that where she took her She pseudonym? took the name, yes. She took, she used the name Sando, mm -hmm. she cut and she in kept mm -hmm. Sand. So. And George, it's probably a name they use in the Berry where she comes from. So she wanted to have a link where she was coming from. So mm -hmm. this is how she found the name. Why a name of a man? Because a woman couldn't write. I told you how were the woman. And not make a living from it at that time. Absolutely. And when she wrote Indiana, everybody thought c'est Balzac who wrote. Mm. Because she was criticizing uh, uh, the jail of a woman when she's uh, married. Mm -hmm. She said it's, it's unfair. Mm -hmm. They raised a woman as a virgin and they sell her as she was a horse mm -hmm. when she's married. This is what she, she criticized. She told, she wrote about a life as a wife. She said it's a jail and she claimed, she said the woman, she can have, she wants to have a sexual pleasure. You know, it's very important. Can you imagine? It was a very conservative, divorce doesn't exist. And she write things like this, a big scandal with the name of a male, so she became famous.
operate as a woman in a man's world, uh, Georges Sand had to negotiate many areas in everyday social life where she was not allowed to go as a woman. So by dressing as a man, she was able to gain access to a lot of parts of society that uh, were missing for other women. Tell us about how she dressed as a man, how she used that, and how it helped her career. Yes, because we... We could think that she was uh, using, uh, she was wearing men clothes uh, as a provocation. Society very conservative, bourgeois, and she's a scandalous woman and sulfurous. Not at all, in fact. It was because it was cheaper. Because when you were a lady, it was extremely expensive to have uh, long dresses in the mud. You have to wash it, to change it. You have uh, shoes uh, very fragile. You couldn't walk, and she liked to walk a lot. She said, in two days, my shoes were dead, with my lady's shoes. So it was cheaper and more convenient, as you said, because she was a journalist. And she wanted to observe, she wanted to write. And when you were a woman, you couldn't go at the court, couldn't go in the theater. You had to be on the side of the theater. You were not allowed to be near the um, stage. stage. Couldn't go in the cafe, weird cafe. And she wanted to go. She wanted to hear music. So first of all, it was not to provocate at all. She could observe. And she was smoking cigars too. Very shocking. This is a caricature of her. You know, we sing Georges Saint smoking a big cigar and look very viril, a man and ugly. ugly. She was not ugly. It's a really big mistake thinking she was ugly. She was very charming and very smart. Maybe we can say that her works have not necessarily had the same success later on, but she was very successful at uh, publicity. She had charisma that she was able to uh, promote. Absolutely. It's Balzac who told her, and he wrote this in, uh, in, uh, in his novels, La Comédie Humaine, he said, even if you, if you want to be glorious, even if you're a genius, if you don't have, at this time the name was Reclame, if you don't have publicity, forget it. More or less, she had many friends, Balzac, Flaubert, and uh, he, he told her, so she understood, like Victor Hugo did the same. You have to be famous. Can you imagine? She didn't have a Facebook, Instagram, or the Snapchat, or all the things, uh, no telephone, no internet. And she was very well known, which means she had a huge charisma. She was a very charismatic woman, extremely smart. George Sand not only inspired herself uh, to write about her travels, but she also wrote about politics. Yes, and she wrote a lot because she didn't have the choice. She did need money. She was a great businesswoman, you know, having money from what she was writing. And she was writing in the night. She had a hammock in Noir and she was uh, eating chocolates and she was writing from midnight to five o'clock. Can you imagine the energy she had and the will she had? So she was involved in politics 1848, the barricades, and she created um, a newspaper, La Cause du Peuple, the people's cause. The people's cause. Uh, well, it didn't last, but she wrote for the workers, working class, which is funny. We have the image of um, this newspaper was sold and created by Sartre and uh, Beauvoir in the 70s. We have the photography of uh, Simone de Beauvoir selling the newspaper in the street of Paris in Saint-Germain-des-Prés. But who created the newspaper? Georges Sand. But she realized she was very disappointed. She was a bit naive with politics. And when Napoleon III arrived power and they were prisoners, she went to see him to ask him to save um, companions and her friends criticized her. She said, oh, you betrayed us. You went to talk with Napoleon III. So she said, you know what, politics? Enough, enough. I don't do politics. It's not for me. And she went back to Noir. That was the end of politics. Her life was, uh, in fact, perhaps more famous than the works that she left behind, even though she wrote many things. What we remember about Georges Sand is her incredible life and her lovers. Tell us about Georges Sand's love life and the different relations that she had throughout her career. Yes, she had, I talk about uh, freedom, so it's true, she had the freedom, sexual freedom. So the, her honeymoon was a big disaster. She said she was extremely disappointed. She was virgin when she got married. After she had lovers, she liked uh, to have an intimate relationship. Uh, but uh, she liked the most when she was in love. 
mixing sex and love for her was the best. And it's true that um, when we think about Georges Sand, we think about a couple, uh, Georges Sand and Alfred de Musset. Musset was really the cursed uh, poet and uh, very good looking, blonde, blue eyes, and um, they were a rock and roll couple. She was older than, uh, than him. That's the image we have of this lady, that she always had much uh, younger lovers, more or less uh, always six years, six years older. So she meets Alfred de Musset, who is very well known, and they go to Venice, you can imagine, I mean, the most romantic couple. The problem, something very, not very romantic, she had, um, how do you say in, uh, in English? Uh, diary. Diary, which is not very romantic, and Musset was not very nice. Musset was an uh, alcoholic, paranoid, probably schizophrenic, and he couldn't bear uh, to see and uh, to smell these awful things that happened in Hotel Daniel in Venice. It was a big, big disaster. She was almost dying in the bed, and uh, she was uh, very cold in the bed and he told her, he was extremely selfish, okay, uh, I go, uh, I leave you alone, I go to visit the city and in fact he was visiting the brothel and seeing prostitutes. So a big disaster, Venice, with a Musset. They broke up, they came back, they wrote each other letters, it was a big scandal. So what she liked, Georges Saint, she was not looking, she didn't say, oh, I like younger men because I like young flesh, not at all. It's the young men who are coming to her because the way she loved it was, she gave a lot of uh, love, like a mother. She liked to console, like a nurse like really like a, a muse and helping, protective. protective love. That's why she was attracting young men. It's exactly the same with Chopin. She was uh, 34 years old, he was 28, and it's always the same. Chopin was a fragile little thing, a bit uh, very feminine. And he didn't like her the first time. Said, oh, this woman, she's ugly. She, she looks like a man. I don't like her. And she, she was very aggressive because she liked art. What she liked it was to have a, something mixing love and um, creativity, mm -hmm. artistic, mm -hmm. because she liked, she knew how to play piano, she liked music, she knew how to paint, she was writing, she was really had a multiple, uh, and she, was, she knew how to cook, she was an excellent cook, a genius. Uh, that was maybe the problem with the lovers, to find a man who could understand her, because what she wanted. It's true, she was a nurse, she was a mother, she gave everything to her friends and lovers, but she was a fragile little woman who was looking for a man who could understand her and not dominate her. It's still the problem of the woman, uh, the ladies now, you know, when you are a smart uh, lady and you need a man who don't tell you, you think too much, have a race with your brain. <laughs> So that's a man told me once. So that's the problem to find a man who can understand and support. Mm -hmm. That's a still and not feel threatened. Absolutely, absolutely. Now you have you're going to finish up with a quote that is has become quite famous, and you're going to explain that there's a twist to this quote. Yes, the most famous um, Alfred de Musset uh, theater. It's c'est on ne badine pas avec l'amour, and it's uh, no trifling with love. And it's yeah, when Perdican, the hero, said to Camille, the idea is um, we 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 suffer when we love. We have disillusion. We are very disappointed. It's very painful. It's it's always like this. When you're dumped, you think, oh no, no it's man. Worse, ag never again. <laughs> never again. I don't yeah. want to see men. It's, love is not for me. I'm, I suffer too much. It's always man or woman. Exactly mm -hmm. what we think each time we have a breakup. And this um, Musset said, maybe yes, but at least you leave. Meaning when you love, you're not dead. If you don't love, you're dead, more or less. So I'm going to read... The quotation of uh, Perdican in the No Trifling with Love. So, farewell, Camille. Return to your convent. And when they tell you one of their hideous stories that have poisoned your nature, give them the answer. All men are liars, fickle, chatterers, hypocrite, proud or cowardly, despicable, sensual. 
all women faithless, deceitful, vain, inquisitive, and depraved. The world is only a bottomless cesspool where shapeless monsters climb and wreathe on mountains of slime. But there is in the world a thing holy and sublime, the union of two of these beings, imperfect and frightful as they are. So now I'm going to go on and to end the quotation. But when I was in the metro, I was reading the letters between Musset and Georges Sand, and I suddenly scream in the metro because one of the letters that Georges Sand wrote to Musset has exactly the quotation what I'm going to read, meaning the quotation I'm going to read stolen, stolen from Alfred, Plagiarized. yes, stolen from Musset to Georges Sand because it's Georges Sand who wrote it. One is often deceived in love, often wounded often unhappy, but one loves, and on the brink of the grave one turns to look back and says, I have suffered often, sometimes I have been mistaken, but I have loved. It is I who have lived, and not an imitation created by my pride and my sorrow.